I love it. I love it. Wow. <laughs> I love it. Look at this. This is, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Hey, I'm not surprised. Hey, what's up my homies, Lay here. This one's gonna be Aspen Ladd taking on Norma Demont. What a weird main event this is, but we're gonna break down the full card anyway. You know how we do it over here, guys. Week in, week out, we're breaking down these matchups. We're stealing from the bookies. As always, man, make sure you Hamzat smash the like button. And if you don't know what the Hamzat smash looks like, I'm gonna show you this week. That's what I want you to do to the like button. And of course, guys, if you don't want to use the Hamzat smash, you can use your own techniques. All right, let's break them down. All right, starting off this card, we've got Ariana Carnalossi taking on Estella Nunes. Right, so Ariane debuted against Angela Hill, where she got basically boxed up. You know, she basically got taught a lesson in that fight. But if you look at her most recent matchup against Liang, nice ground and pound stoppage. And I don't know how many of you guys remember that fight, but it was crazy. Now the opponent, Estela Nunes, a pretty decent Muay Thai fighter, but, you know, the big but is she hasn't had a fight in over three years. So when you look at the tape, when you look at her Muay Thai skills, it's nice to see, but three years is a long time, man. Man, you think of Misha Tate, she was off for a long time, comes back, gets a win. You think of Jessica Penne, she was off, comes back, gets a win. Is Estela Nunes going to be the third woman to spend a, a considerable amount of time off, come back and get a win? I'm going to say no. I think Ariana Carnalossi is going to use a lot of boxing pressure. Look to keep Estelle Nunes on the outside and basically win with bigger punches. I'm not the best at predicting women's MMA. I'm really not, but I'm quite confident in this one. So I'll take Ariana Carnalossi. And my numbers, I'm going to put Ariane minus 200. And we're just going to check the actual lines. Carnalossi minus 170. Even minus 165, wow. So yeah, a little bit shocked with that one, but at the end of the day, you know, predicting women's MMA is very difficult. But I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Carnalossi on this one. Alright, my homies, we've got Brandon Davis taking on Denar Bakgiro. A pretty decent matchup. Now Brandon Davis is a guy that we know pretty well. He did get cut from the UFC, but you know, if you get cut and you put wins together you're going to get another opportunity. You know, thinking of the game of Brandon Davis, his jiu-jitsu is pretty nice, but doesn't really use his jiu-jitsu unless the opponent takes him to the mat. You know, I remember some people picking Brandon Davis to beat Chikadze purely because he's a grappler or has that grappling part in his game. But the thing is, man, Brandon Davis isn't a wrestler. So when he tries to take down the opponent to use the grappling, you're not really seeing Brandon Davis. You know, Brandon Davis is the type of guy who wants to fight on the feet. But if you take him to the mat, that's where he's going to show you, look, I've got some pretty nice jujitsu. Now the opponent, Denar Bakgirol. You know, you look at this guy getting the lead hook knockouts. Back to back. Yeah, back to back. Really nasty. So if I'm looking at who's more powerful... Who's got the more damaging strikes? I'm going to say it's Denar Bakgirol. The way that Brandon Davis is going to win this matchup, maybe he's going to have to have the higher output. Maybe try to take Denar Bakgirol to the mat, but like I said, he's not a wrestler. And when you've got a guy who's primarily a striker trying to change his game because he knows the striking might not be good enough, it's not really a prediction I want to make. So I'm going to side with Denar Bakgirol to be the more damaging striker you know whether it's low kicks lead hooks I think he can score against Brandon Davis maybe a TKO but Brandon Davis you know really really tough my numbers may be a little bit harsh I'm gonna say Denar Bakgirol minus 300 and the actual numbers we've got Denar Bakgirol minus 200 maybe some value there maybe all right, we've got Ludovic Klein taking on Nate Landwehr. 
Man, this is this is a nice matchup to be honest. The reason why this one's a nice matchup, when you picture the two styles, you can see a good fight. And the reason for that is Ludovic Klein seems to be more technical in his striking, whereas Nate Landwehr has no regard for his health. He's just looking to throw down. You know, he's a madman. So yeah, picturing those two styles inside the smaller octagon. It's going to be a good fight. You look at what Ludovic Klein done to Shane Young. You know, he has got finishing power. But then you look at Mike Trezano kind of keeping him on the back foot for 15 minutes. And that's where you wonder, can the pressure and toughness of Nate Landwehr be the result of this fight? You know, it's almost like a Jamie Malarkey and Devontae Smith type vibe you know Devonte is quicker more technical and you know Jamie Malarkey is going to eat damage but if the pressure can be the result then Nate Landwehr can win this one you know and that's simply what he has to do he has to keep Ludovic Klein on the back foot and be the aggressor and if he can do that you know it's a win but if Ludovic Klein on the flip side can you know land those clean strikes and look to control the octagon himself then you're going to find out that there's levels to the game you know toughness might not be enough for Nate Lamware it's a good matchup I want to see the Ludovic Klein of the UFC debut I don't want to see Ludovic Klein on the back foot the way he was against Mike Trezano and that's why we tune in every Saturday night you know we want to find out which Ludovic Klein is going to show up you know, I know which Nate is going to turn up. It's going to be the crazy guy who's looking to eat your punches to land his punches. But that's what we're going to get here. A technical guy against a madman. My prediction in this one, I'm going to take Ludovic Klein. If he can control the octagon, then I think his striking is going to be the difference. Of course, like I said, the flip side. If Nate Landwehr can use the pressure and be the aggressor, more than not, then he's going to win this fight. My numbers on this one, I'd put Ludovic around maybe minus 180 because you don't know which guy's going to show up. Is it going to be the Ludovic of the UFC debut or is it going to be the guy that's constantly backing up? You know, you don't want to back up against Nate. You want to let this guy know, look, you have bad striking defense and that's going to be why you lose. And if you're backing up the whole time, then he's not aware of that bad striking defense He's going to have a good fight. He's going to look like the guy who wants it more. So yeah, I believe Octagon Control is going to be the result. And I'll take Ludovic Klein. All right, guys. Sajara Eubanks taking on Luana Carolina. Sajara Eubanks is primarily a grappler. Luana is primarily a striker. So taking a look at Sajara's last fight. You know, she completely obliterated Elise Reed. You know when Tyson Fury said a few days ago, Total obliteration of a dosa. <laughs> it means total obliteration of a dosa. Man, that's really what Sajara Eubanks done to Elise Reed. <laughs> I'm sorry, man, but she did. Just total obliteration. Now, it's kind of interesting because Sajara Eubanks, she has lost a few fights. But if you look at all of her losses, they're all at bantamweight. You know, has Sajara Eubanks lost a fight at 125 yet? I don't think she has. But you know what, man? I'm going to say this is the first time we're going to see Sajara Eubanks lose at flyweight. Simply because, you know, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I was leaning towards Sajara Eubanks. And then I realized my women's MMA predictions are not good. So I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to outsmart myself. My prediction is going to be Luana Carolina. If she can keep the fight standing, keep to the striking, she might beat Sajara Eubanks. And to be honest, man, Sajara, she can box. So even if it's striking, it's going to be a good fight. My numbers, man, I'll keep them close, put them both minus 110. And the actual numbers, okay, we've got, we've got Luana plus 200. So maybe my initial feeling on... Sajara being able to win this one was right. Guys, don't listen to me on women's MMA, man. Just don't do it. All right, we've got Danny Roberts taking on Ramazan Amiv. Now, let's try to keep this one nice and simple. 
what we've got here is wrestling versus boxing. You know, and that's not to say that Danny Roberts can't grapple, can't wrestle. I was live in Germany when he fought David Zawada and, you know, displayed some nice grappling in that fight. But when you're thinking of ways that Danny Roberts is going to win this matchup, I don't think it's going to be wrestling. You know, if he tries to grapple with Ramazan, it's not going to go too well. We know about these Russians. You know, Ramazan Amiv, Russian grappler. The only time he's lost inside the UFC was against Tony Martin. And Tony Martin displayed a beautiful calf kick in this fight. So maybe Danny Roberts can look at that fight and say, you know, if I can land the calf kick over and over against Ramazan Amiv, I can slow him down a bit. Since Ramazan Amiv lost to Tony Martin, he's for Nicholas Stoltzer and David Zawada. Man, Danny Roberts got a split win against David Zawada and Ramazan got a split win too. You know, small world. But yeah, in my opinion, guys, what we've got here is wrestling versus boxing. Now, of course, Danny Roberts is going to win this fight if it stays striking. Ramazan Amiv is going to win this fight if we can get to the grappling. It's really as simple as that. I know Danny Roberts has been knocked out badly by Michelle Pereira, but Ramazan Amiv isn't doing backflips. He isn't spinning. He isn't jumping off the cage. Yeah, my prediction, I'm going to go with the Russian. I'm going to have to go with the grappling, the wrestling. And of course, every moment we're not in that wrestling exchange, Danny Roberts is going to be landing the jab. He's going to be winning the striking. One or the other, I'm going Team Russia against, against my home country fighter, Danny Roberts. My numbers on this one, I would put Ramazan Amiv around that minus 200 mark. And that's just because these Russians, they're dominant with it, man. You know, once they get to the, to the single leg, they go to the double, to body locks. You know, they're dominant with it. I like what Danny Roberts done to Zalim, who's a Russian. But Zalim's a bit of a crazy guy. Whereas Ramazan Amiv, he's cold, composed, all about the grappling. So yeah, I'll take the Russian, I'll take the wrestling. It's a good matchup though. All right, we've got Andrew Sanchez taking on Bruno Silva. Now, Bruno Silva in his UFC debut. Man, I'm going to say it again. Total obliteration. It means total obliteration of a dosser. You know, man, just nasty. When Bruno Silva was on top, those punches were just, you know, they'd sleep you for a week. Now, the opponent, Andrew Sanchez, we know about this guy. He's been in the UFC for some time now. He's a wrestler. He likes to take you to the mat. He wants to win with his wrestling. Now, to be completely honest, Andrew Sanchez did deliver, you know, total obliteration to the same guy. So they do share a common opponent and, you know, the same serving to that opponent, right? <laughs> you know, Andrew Sanchez is the better wrestler. But I like what I see from Bruno Silva in the UFC debut. You know, if Andrew tries to grapple, tries to wrestle with Bruno Silva, if he ends up on the bottom, we know what's coming. Nasty ground and pound. Now, if this matchup stays striking, I know Andrew Sanchez delivered that total obliteration for Wellington Terman. But if it stays striking, I think Bruno Silva is going to get the better in that type of fight. So yeah, my prediction's going to be the Brazilian to defeat the wrestler, Andrew Sanchez. My numbers, I'd put Bruno Silva, I'd say six times out of 10, so minus 150. And the actual numbers, we've got Bruno Silva minus 130. So maybe some value on the Bruno Silva line. All right, my homies, you know what time it is. Smoke break, smoke break, smoke break. If you waited to smoke with me, amen. If you've been smoking this whole time, double amen. If you're not a smoker, but you enjoy the smoke breaks, triple amen gang, let's go. Hey, I hope all of you guys are doing well, doing blessed, having a good day, having a good week, man. And guys, just before we get into the smoke break, here's my Instagram, UFC Lay. And here's my Patreon, where I place all my bets for Contender Series and for UFC. UFC GA. Massive shout out to all the homies on Patreon. Amen. 
Guys, I asked you last week, what is your favorite drink smoke combination? Man, we got so many comments on that. So many comments. And there were some fancy combos, man. Fancy combos out there, eh? You know, the lighter can't be doing it. You cannot be doing it now. Now the smoke break topic this week, a subscriber, or I don't know if you're subscribed. If you're not subscribed, make sure you do subscribe. But I got a comment last week and it was, if you was a mixed martial artist, what song would you walk out to? So guys, that's going to be the topic. What song would you walk out to? So get down to the comment section and let me know. What is that song you're walking out to? You know, you're about to have it out. You're about to just inflict, you know, total obliteration, right? What song are you walking out to? Now, if you're like me, man, there's like a hundred songs running through your head right now. But if I had to pick one, wait, let me go to my Spotify. Right, if I had to pick one song, what am I going to be walking out to? Do you know what, guys? I've just seen it. I'm walking out to I've got five on it. I'm walking out to I've got five on it. You know, that's a stoner song. So yeah, let me know in the comment section, guys. What song are you walking out to? Now, if I see anything in the comment section that says I'm walking out to Titanic, bro, listen. Don't be putting that in the comment section, bro. I know some of you are going to be trying to play jokes. No, I'm only joking, man. If you want to walk out to Titanic, you can walk out to Titanic, bro. Let's go. All right, man. Let's break down the rest of these matchups. All right, guys. We've got Julian Marquez taking on Jordan Wright. And I'm going to spark up and I'll tell you why. Julian Marquez, the octagon name, the Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, how cold is that? That's pretty cold, right? Now take Jordan Wright's octagon name, the Beverly Hills Ninja. You know, talk about going from coldness to just, what is that, Jordan Wright? What is that? What? Now Jordan Wright, just like his octagon name, he basically sees himself as a ninja so that means he's gonna fire kicks fire knees spin he's gonna do some ninja shit right julian marquez isn't really about the ninja lifestyle he's more about the cuban missile lifestyle right he's gonna fire the bombs at your head look to knock you out man when i look at this matchup instantly i think you know julian marquez is gonna knock him out and i am gonna make that prediction but Jordan Wright, man, with the kicks. It only takes one kick that you don't see to just spin your brain. You know, it, he can do it. I'm not going to say it's a lock, but I am going to go with the boxing pressure and just that aggressive style that Julian Marquez has. You know, Jordan Wright did get a nice win against Jamie Pickett. You know, kind of looked like a ninja in that one, so... Credit to him for that, but can he do that against Julian Marquez? I'm not going to say it's going to be impossible for Jordan Wright, but it is going to be a difficult task compared to Jamie Pickett, and that's why I'm going to side with Julian Marquez. Round one, round two, TKO. My numbers on this one, I'll put Julian Marquez minus 200 to not get head kicked by Jordan Wright. And the actual numbers, we've got Julian Marquez minus 200 up to minus 220. You know, spot on. If Jordan Wright is going to win this one, it's probably going to be a stoppage. So maybe look at the TKO prop. But my prediction, guys, I'm going to take Julian Marquez to put a stop to the Beverly Hills Ninja. And man, it was quite difficult to not use the total obliteration on this breakdown, man. That's got to be a new thing on this channel, right? Mano Fiero taking on Myra Silva. I've already broke this fight down, so I'm not going to spend too much time. I'm just going to try basically give you the result of this fight. Myra Silva probably has the better jujitsu, in my opinion, and she's a pretty nasty striker. Mano Fiero takes violence to the next level, though, in my opinion. I think she's nastier than Myra Silva when it comes to striking. 
Now, I said Myra Silva has got the better jiu-jitsu, so maybe if she can take the fight to the mat, she can look to exploit Mano Fiero. But I think Mano Fiero is maybe the better wrestler. So if you've got a fighter that has better jiu-jitsu, but the opponent is probably stronger in the clinch, probably has better wrestling, then looking at jiu-jitsu being the answer, maybe that's not where we should look. I think the answer is going to be Mano Fiero wins this one because she's a better striker and because she probably keeps this fight standing. You know, if you picture these two girls in a striking battle, I just see Mano Fiero proving that she's a higher level girl. Now, anything can happen in a fight. Can Myra Bueno Silva land that knockout punch? Maybe, but there's a good chance that Mano Fiero just proves she's higher level. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, that's going to be my prediction. Again, I'm going to take Mano Firo. I like her karate Muay Thai style. You know, she's really nasty on the feet. And like I said, man, she might be the one who is the better grappler when it comes to wrestling. Myra Silva, better jujitsu knowledge. But if you can't get it to the mat, now you're left in a, a Mano Firo fight on the feet. So yeah, I'm going to stick with Mano Firo. My numbers... I think I put minus 250 up to minus 300 last time and I'll I'll stick with that. And the actual numbers, we've got Mano Fiero minus 200. You know, maybe some value there. Mano Fiero is just a high level prospect and I think she continues. All right, we've got Jim Miller taking on Eric Gonzalez. Guys, do we even need to speak about Jim Miller? You know, everyone knows who Jim Miller is. He's been fighting for many lifetimes. You know, a veteran's veteran, a legend of the game. You know, we always speak about veterans, man. You can't teach them anything new. There's nothing that Jim Miller's going to learn at this point that he doesn't already know. The only thing Jim Miller needs to do at this point in his career is simply look at the opposition and say to yourself, how do I win this fight? I'm 38 years old. I shouldn't be competing probably, but... How do I prove people wrong? How do I win this one? Anyone who's been watching fighting for a considerable amount of time, we all know the answer. Jim Miller can submit this guy. He just needs to grapple. You know, Eric Gonzalez, you know, not a terrible guy. I look at the tape, he's not bad. But the amount of experience that Jim Miller has, you know, 50 fights, a black belt, just a... A well-rounded veteran. If Jim Miller goes in there and looks to trade on the feet, then he might lose. But if Jim Miller goes in there and straight away he's onto a single into a double and he's initiating the grappling straight away round one, there's a good chance he's going to find a submission. And I know we speak about Jim Miller with the cardio. It's not great. And that's why he needs to get to the grappling straight out the gate. You know, don't go a whole round or two minutes, three minutes dancing, trading. Jim Miller will win this fight if he can grapple the opponent. And that's what I'm going to say he does here. You know, Jim Miller was originally supposed to fight Nicholas Motta. And I believe that would have been a more difficult fight than what it is against Eric Gonzalez. So, yeah, Jim Miller, man, just grapple this guy. Take the dub. Let's go. OG. I'm with the OG on this one. Yeah, my numbers at this point, I would say Jim Miller wins six times out of 10. So minus 150. And we've got Jim Miller. Please be a favorite. We've got Jim Miller minus 200. So even the bookies are saying, yo, if Jim Miller grapples, the OG is going to win. You know, sometimes it's good when the bookies agree with you because they're not trying to give you plus money on a Jim Miller opponent, right? They're not trying to just hand you a free ticket. You know, look at this, plus 150. You know he's going to beat Jim Miller. But a lot of people are going to look at this line and think, man, I can bet against Jim Miller here. He's over, he's across the road. You know, he's done for. But in this situation, against Eric Gonzalez, maybe there's another win for the OG. And the bookies agree. All right, we've got Andre Arlovsky taking on Carlos Philippe. Low-key, a really difficult prediction to make. You know, taking a look at Carlos Philippe, he lost that debut to Sergei Spivak, which is okay. Then he beat Jorgen de Castro as a decent underdog. 
and basically showed us in that fight, look, he's not going to knock me out. I'm going to walk him down and beat him on output. Then against Justin Taffa, you know, that was a close one, man. Justin maybe should have won that fight. And then uh, another close one, which was a split decision against Jake Collier. So yeah, Carlos Filipe, back-to-back close decisions. And now you're taking on a veteran with over 50 pro fights. You know, guys, I'm not the biggest advocate of betting on Andre Arlovsky. I don't really predict him to win many fights. I'm not the best at predicting Andre Arlovsky's fights. You know, he just kind of surprises you. You know, gets knocked out sometimes, but then he'll show up and it'll be like a veteran performance. Like against Sherman, you know, the low kick. That was a veteran move. Against Tanner Boza, just landing the heavier punches. Veteran move. Against Philippe Linz, you know, the, he, he looks like a veteran sometimes. And then other times it looks like he shouldn't be in there. He is 42 years old. Honestly, I'm going to predict Andre Arlovsky to win. And now that I've done that, Carlos Filipe is probably going to knock him out. I just think if Arlovsky can beat Tanner Boza, arguably one of the best in the heavyweight division at moving, if he can beat a guy like that, then he might be able to tee off on Carlos Filipe in round two and round three. You know, Carlos Filipe has this Muay Thai style and he is really game to, to throw down, but Arlovsky might just get in, get out, you know? Pepper him with the jab, hit a few low kicks, use a lot of movement on the outside. Just a veteran performance. And even if it's close, I know Carlos Filipe has won two split decisions, but this time it could be like a split loss, right? If those split decision wins tell us anything about Carlos Filipe, they tell us that you can have a close fight with this guy. So I'm going to stick with the OG, Andre Arlovsky. You know, I'm team OG on this one. Jim Miller and Arlovsky, team OG. Let's go. My numbers on this one, I'd put Arlovsky minus 130. And the actual numbers, both of these guys minus 110. So yeah, the bookies are just like, yo, make a play if you dare. You know, how many of you guys are going to make a play on this one? Let me know in the comment section. Are you going to play this one? All right, this main event is a little bit weird. If you've enjoyed this breakdown, please hands that smash the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, you know, this is what I want you to do to the subscribe button. If you haven't hit the subscribe button yet, this is what I want you to do. Send the subscribe button and the like button too. Send it to another realm far, far away. All right, this main event, you know, it's a weird one. We've got Norma DeMont taking on Aspen Ladd. Norma DeMont was originally supposed to fight Holly Holm. And this matchup, I don't know if I want to say it's an easier matchup or a more difficult matchup. Whether it's more difficult or it's an easier matchup, I think the right thing to say is it's a far different matchup. You know, Holly Holm is a brilliant, brilliant kickboxer. Aspen Ladd is a brilliant, brilliant wrestler. Now, Aspen Ladd is moving up to 145. So again, that's another thing that I don't know what to make of it, in all honesty. She's missing weight at 135. But is she a 145er? In my opinion, no, she's not. But she is still going to be fighting Norma DeMont at 145. So I have to ask myself, can she grapple with Norma DeMont? Norma DeMont is a big girl. You know, she's she's kind of thick, you know. Can Aspen Ladd still grapple with Norma DeMont? I'm going to say yes. You know, it's not going to be like she's grappling these girls at 135 where she looks extremely dominant. It might not look like that, but... If you put these girls on the mat or put these girls up against the fence, Aspen Ladd is, she's still going to make your life difficult. Whether you're Norma Damont or Yana Kuniskaya, Sajara Eubanks, right? She's still going to be hard to clinch with. Now, Norma Damont has some nice striking. I wouldn't say it's super high level, but you can see against Felicia Spencer, you know, that Sander style, you know, she's not bad. 
Aspen Lad isn't really much of a striker. And that could be an area that she loses in this fight. It's just a really weird main event. It's really weird. I'm going to side with Aspen Lad. You know, Norma DeMont, she's not Macy Chia's on. She's not an MGK. The only time Aspen Lad has been hurt with, uh, with strikes was against Jermaine Durandame. And she had a horrible, horrible weight cut. So if Norma DeMont lands her best punch, you know, she might not put down Aspen Lad if the weight cut isn't too bad. One thing I do want to mention, guys. Remember when Tony Ferguson made weight and then made weight like two weeks later? to fight Justin Gagey. Making weight and then making weight again straight after is not good for your body or your brain. It's just not good. Now Aspen Ladd did miss weight, but she still cut a lot of weight and she's doing it again not too long after. Now is she cutting back down to, to 135 the way Tony Ferguson cut down to 155? No, she's not. The weight cut is going to be easier but I imagine she's still probably going to cut a little bit of weight. To be honest, man, that point probably isn't going to play into this fight. If Norma DeMont can drop Aspen Ladd, I'm not going to say it's because of the back-to-back -back weight cuts. I'm going to say it's because she's a bigger girl with some, you know, decent punching power. A good Sander style. But my prediction in this one, I'm going to take Aspen Ladd to push Norma up against the fence. Take her to the mat round in round out potentially a ground and pound stoppage or a submission i'm just interested to see what it looks like with aspen lad at 145 like i said man it's a weird main event my numbers i'm gonna put aspen minus 130 and we've got aspen lad minus 150 so it's not minus 300 like she was against mgk so even the bookies are like yo I don't know about giving the public Norma DeMont at a big price. I don't know how this one's going to go down. You know, they're, they're playing it smart. I would put Aspen a slight favourite, but there's just unknowns. There's unknowns in this matchup. As always, guys, let me know who you're taking in the main event, the co-main. Let me know about your parlays, your underdogs, all of that good stuff. And guys, remember, keep your eyes to the sky, never glue to your shoes. Mac Miller. Peace.